Thank you very much, Jean-Éric Paquet, and a warm welcome from my side for this great session. I can promise this to you. Let me start with a personal note. I was one of several people who were engaged in various initiatives before the European Research Council was set up. And this was way back then, and I remember vividly one conference, a big, well-attended conference, that was organized under the Danish EU presidency, and it had the title, Can There Be a European Research Council? Now, the rest, as we know, is history. In 2007, the ESC was established. And now, 12 years later, we can count almost 10,000 ESC grantees, each of whom has a wonderful team of young people coming from all over the world. And personally, when I meet especially a starting grantee, ESC starting grantee, they look at me with a big smile and say, the ESC grant has changed my life. And this is very satisfactory. We are here tonight at the eve of Horizon Europe that brings some changes, as every framework program does. And there is another question mark in the room. And the question mark is the title of this session, Can Blue Sky Research, you can also call it curiosity-driven, fundamental research, whatever you like, can blue sky research spark innovation? Question mark. And it's a question mark that is not new. In 1930, <coughs> Abraham Flexner, a US reformer, wrote a manifesto with the title The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. And in this manifesto, he has a long list of the wonderful things that previous seemingly useless knowledge had brought to fruition. And this manifesto was so convincing that he found two donors, brother and sister, who helped to set up the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, which in the 30s and 40s became the home of Einstein, of other scholars and scientists who had to flee Europe as refugees under totalitarian regimes. And it was also the home of John von Neumann, and one of the first computers was set up in this institute devoted to the usefulness of useless knowledge. So we find ourselves in a very different world from the 30s, also sometimes we have the feeling there are dark shadows reaching back from the 30s to today. And this new world, this global world, also brings with it a globalized science. If you look at the world publication figures, there is a decline of publications coming from US and Europe, not because scientists are less productive, but because Chinese scientists and other scientists from Asia are catching up, if you look at the total numbers. And so, we are here to discuss tonight the question that was posed, can blue sky research spark innovation? And we have heard before, and the whole three days are really about some of the great challenges that humanity faces. It's about pandemics, it's about sustainability, digitalization, everything else. And the panel you will hear is convinced that blue sky research, basic research, is indispensable in order to meet these challenges. But of course, the question is also, how can it spark innovation? At this point, I also want to thank Commissioner Carlos Mödas. He had the vision to support the ERC and to set up the EIC as a kind of complementary institution, but at the same time modeling it after the ERC 
in terms of excellence. And therefore, I would like now to invite the wonderful panel. We have two Nobel laureates. We have three Kabli Prize winners. And I ask you all to come here to the stage and to take a seat. I will now introduce you, starting with Emmanuel Charpentier, here on my, on my right. She is uh, the winner of the Kabli Prize 2018 for the invention of CRISPR-Cas9, together with uh, Virginius Shish, Shish Schnick. Uh, my Lithuanian is improving. Shish Schnick and, uh, and uh, Mrs. Dudna. And uh, her trajectory took her from Paris, from the Institut Pasteur, to the Rockefeller University in New York and other institutions, to Vienna, to Sweden. And now she is uh, at, in, in Berlin. Since 2014, she is um, director of the Max Planck Institute of Infection Biology and recently also the head of the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens. Then it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Ferring. I'm not mentioning the many prizes because then we would just listen to a long list. Ben Ferringer from Groningen. He has two ESC uh, grants, advanced grants, before he received the Nobel Prize in 2016. And <clears throat> he has received the Nobel Prize for something that has preoccupied him and worked on with a lot of passion for many years, rotary molecular motors, and he will tell us a little bit more uh, about it. Then <clears throat> Virginius Schickschnis comes from Vilnius. He received his uh, PhD, the equivalent of the PhD uh, in Moscow, but then he returned to his hometown and um, he has been one of the discoverers or inventors of CRISPR as well, and he will also tell us a little bit about it. And he also received the Kabli Prize. Then uh, Christine uh, Petit, she is professor at the Collège de France. She started out uh, in the Institut Pasteur, um, also in the Institut Pasteur, and she is an eminent geneticist and has um, discovered the function of various genes. And the Kavli Prize came in recognition of the mo molecular and neural mechanisms of hearing. She also has an ESC advanced grant. And last but not least, Jean-Marie Len, known to many of you here in, in the audience, Nobel laureate, also an ESC advanced grant after he received uh, the, the Nobel Prize in um, 87 in chemistry for his studies of the chemical basis of molecular uh, recognition. Since then, he has moved on to something that is called supramolecular chemistry. So this is a very brief introduction, and in order to get the discussion going, I think it's appropriate that you tell us very briefly a little bit of what is behind these words that I have just read out. What is it you are actually doing, and how would you explain it to an audience that is not familiar with the work you do? Emmanuel. Okay, so I will start. Um, I define myself actually as a basic uh, scientist, so I'm, I'm a macrobiologist and my institute is mainly focused on understanding mechanisms that allow to explain how bacteria can cause diseases in humans, but we are also interested to a certain extent to understand how bacteria can defend themselves against viruses, because bacteria can also be infected by viruses, as we can be infected by viruses. And this is this type of research, actually, that led to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which uh, I guess uh, some of you, or most of you, may have heard. So this very transformative genome engineering uh, technology 
that allows to edit genes and modify genomes and their expression in virtually every type of cells and organisms which uh, the biologists can uh, work with in, in the laboratory. And this technology also holds uh, uh, very big promises with regard to treatment of diseases such as cancer and also certain genetic disorders for which a treatment is not available in our days and is also extremely promising with regard to the engineering of plant uh, crops. So, so did, I, did I hear you uh, correctly? You said it's a technology. So as a technology, it's bound to lead to some kind of application and innovation. And so what is the kind of connection you make in your own work between So what was this? very interesting is that I'm not so sure whether the type of research that led to this very transformative technology could be defined initially as innovative research because this is a type of research that was done 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, what is very clear in this type of research is that researching on bacteria uh, and also the type of prokaryotes that defend themselves against viruses can lead to the understanding of mechanisms that can be harnessed as technology to manipulate genes and their expression. So it was is very interesting with this discovery is that it's really basic, basic science, extremely basic science that led to a technology that is transformative and so transformative that it really boosts tremendously the innovation in life sciences and medicine to a speed uh, that, uh, at a speed that was never actually uh, uh, witnessed um, before. So uh, when we described and also Virginius can uh, talk about uh, the description of the basic mechanisms, we could harness this mechanism in bacteria in, uh, in very fast in a technology that was applied within six months of time to really edit genes in virtually every cell and organism. And so in principle, very, very fast applications and then innovations that uh, that uh, allowed as well uh, a lot of applications that were not specifically applications that would have been considered uh, prior to CRISPR-Cas9, and specifically uh, a speed of application and a versatility of the technologies that led to multiple versions of the technology and therefore uh, really uh, increase the different aspects of applications yeah. in life sciences and beyond. Maybe that's the point to introduce one concept here, which is very crucial to everyone working in basic science. First of all, you don't know what you will find. There is inherent uncertainty in basic research. But nature comes as an ally to the researcher in the form of something we call serendipity. You discover something that you have not been looking for, but you realize the significance of it. And this plays a very important role. And therefore, um, we have to, uh, to accept it's uncertain. We don't know what we will find. But along the way, serendipity helps us again and again in unexpected ways to find something. Ben, tell us a little bit about your motors and everyone who has seen a video of what you do is just fascinated. It's like a Lego play, but you go down to the, to the atoms. Thank you very much. Uh, we work on molecular motors and molecular machines. That means molecular nanotechnology, building a motor. We build the smallest motor in this world, one billionth of a meter in size. Now, you might ask, why motors? Your, your body, no, let me first say in your car, in our planes and whatever, the factories, it's full with motors and machines. In your body, the fact that I can talk, that I can see you, that I can lift my arm, is full with biological motors, nanomotors. But this bottle does not move, this paper does not move, this plastic does not move. How to make something move at the molecular scale? That was the fundamental scientific question. And I often get the question, why are you doing this? Why do you get ESC grants for doing this? <laughs> the same question was asked to the Wright brothers more than 100 years ago, when they were flying for the first time. Why do it? Man can't need to fly. If God wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. 
let me tell you, we were working on smart materials and information storage, making switches. And just by accident, we discovered that a molecule was not switching back, but was switching forward. And when you realize that, you can make a rotary motor. And that is what we designed, based with light as the energy source. So it's a light-driven system. Science fiction. What we do now, at this moment, which I would have never predicted, that is my students make now materials that repair themselves services that clean themselves. And many groups around the world suddenly realize that when you can something making moving, you can make coatings for cars maybe in the future that you don't have to wash your car anymore. Solar panels that clean themselves, your windows clean themselves. Now people work on these self-repairing materials. You make a scratch and it repairs itself. We now work together with the medical people on smart drugs because you can build in this tiny nanomachines, and you can put a pharmaceutical a drug on and off, exactly on the spot. Think about this tiny tumor, yeah? Where you can now, with high precision, make these smart drugs. This is what we are currently working on, and actually we just got a proof of concept grant from the EU for a startup company of my students to work on some smart drugs for cancer treatment. We will see how it works mm. in the future. Completely unforeseen, science fiction type research, and 20 years later, we see in it suddenly enormous potential for all kinds of applications. Not only maybe with our motor, but once you know the principles, it will lead to a lot of innovations. Thank you. And just a, a short sentence on the proof of concept um, idea the ESC started early on. Um, asking themselves, what can we do in order to, um, you know, bridge this unfortunate divide between applied science and basic science, which uh, is so stifling in our way of thinking and looking at the world. And uh, we thought, well, um, let us uh, set up a small grant for the grantee, but it can also be someone in the team of the of, of the ERC grantee who has an idea, because you see so many possibilities, as you said, you know, from coating, from washing windows, etc. And perhaps these, especially the young people, they want to turn it into something else. So the proof of concept idea, I think, has raised the awareness in young people among ESC grantees everywhere. Ideas can be taken further, and there is not this divide. This is basic, this is research. You, uh, you can do basic research in the morning and applied research in the afternoon, and vice versa. So let's not forget this. Virginius, the word serendipity must have a special ring also in your ears. Is this correct? Yeah, exactly. So, so my name is Virginia Shikshnis, and it sounds like a sound check. I'm still checking whether I'm able to pronounce my family name myself. Yeah. Shikshnis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually, in my lab, we are studying immune system of bacteria. Yeah, yes, you probably not many of you know that actually bacteria still have a very primitive immune system, but the question is, should we care about the immune system of bacteria instead of the caring about immune system of humans? But we should, because bacteria is very important for us. And one reason is because actually in our gut we have much more bacteria that outnumbers uh, the number of uh, our cells. And uh, next, bacteria is very important uh, because bacteria is used for production of, of drugs and also for cheese and yogurt. And actually, if a bacteria is unhealthy, or it loses fight against viruses that are major parasites of bacteria, so then the tons of yogurt can go bad, and actually tons of milk actually go, go, go to waste. And bacteria, immune system protects bacteria against invading viruses of, of bacteria. And in my lab, we, we aim to understand actually how different antiviral defense systems that are present in bacteria helps bacteria to fight against viruses. And actually, this is a very basic biological question. And CRISPR-Cas that actually we are talking uh, about today is one of antiviral defense system of bacteria, part of bacteria immune system. And actually, we aim to understand how this system actually 
vaccine bacteria, and, and then actually we were able to resolve the molecular mechanism behind this uh, antiviral defense system of bacteria. And then, actually, when you understand how things work, so then you can start thinking about innovation. So, actually, we discovered the molecular mechanism of CRISPR-Cas system just driven by pure curiosity. But then, when you understand the mechanism, so you can start thinking about, okay, so this is programmable system. Could we program it for some useful applications? And this is how genome editing tools appeared. So, but, but curiosity-driven research was behind this story. Yeah. yeah, and it's always the research question that is driving you. And now I turn to Christine Petit. What were your questions that you had that led you to what the Kavli Foundation and also the ERC recognized as something uh, that should be pursued further? Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say that I have always been fascinated by sensory system and especially by hearing, um, because, let's say, without hearing, uh, there is no way to, uh, for language acquisition, for music appreciation, mm -hmm. and also this is the base of the communication, and let's say uh, this is the base of our social links. This is what makes us as humans, I think. So this was a very important driving force for me, and uh, I started, uh, um, let's say, um, looking, um, I had an interest, and so I started examining what has been done in the field. And I shortly realized that a lot had been done by physicists, because we are dealing with a mechanical senses, mm -hmm. which has amazing properties. So basically, they were able um, to obtain some basic principle of the way this sensory system works. And I realized that we had absolutely no information regarding the molecular, the molecular mechanism, that is the molecule being involved with this system. And I start wondering why. And I realized that was such because this system contains very few cells for each cochlear cell, each, let's say, cell type that it houses. So, uh, this makes it impossible to get access to these key molecules involved in hearing by conventional, let's say, biochemical approach or classical molecular genetic approaches. Uh, if we compare, for instance, with the visual system in the retina, uh, you have 100 million of photoreceptor cells, and in our sensory organ, the auditory sensory organ, only a few thousand. So how could we get access to these molecules? And uh, um, I realized soon that uh, maybe it will be possible using a genetic approach, because the genetic approach has an efficiency which is completely independent of the number of molecules being involved in a given process. What means a, a genetic approach? It means to pull out the gene responsible for hearing impairment, for deafness. So I decided to move to that field and, uh, let's say, to try to pull out the gene. At that time, none of the genes responsible for deafness had been identified. Basically, for some uh, cultural reason, in the sense that deaf people tend to intermarry in developed countries, so there is no possibility to trace a genes derived from the father and the mother because they, they will lead to similar, let's say, a hearing impairment. So, I, I saw that I could solve this problem working in geographic isolates because geographic isolates are generally been funded by a few numbers of individuals. And if in a community um, peop some people were deaf, likely a single gene was involved. So I started developing a, a close collaboration with several groups around the Mediterranean Sea in ge where geographic isolates are still persisting. So we pull out the genes. And uh, uh, let's say thereafter, we start asking how, let's say, the protein encoded by these deafness genes are assembling together, are forming, let's say, nanomachinery, which are absolutely essential for hearing. So to get, let's say, to this point, we have to move the lab, in fact, from a lab of genetics to an interdisciplinary lab with a um, physiologist, a physicist, and also biochemist. 
And this way, we were able to decipher some nanomachinery, maybe not with the detail that you presented, but for instance, how can we open, let's say, the mechanosensitive channels in the sensory air, on the sensory cells, how sound creates tension in this channel and will convert sound stimulation in an electrical signal. So now we are in a position in which we know quite a lot in molecular terms, meaning that we are in a position to take another challenge, that is to try to cure deafness. And so far there is no treatment, there is only prosthesis that can there are only prosthesis that can be proposed to patients. But with all of this information, a large part of the field is moving to therapeutic aspects. And again, okay, we move to that direction and we have another challenge, a basic challenge, which is the fact that for taking full advantage of restoration hearing at the peripheral level, you need brain plasticity. And we don't know enough on brain plasticity to have a full, let's say, benefit of what we will restore at the peripheral level. Thank you. A fascinating way of describing what, what you do. And again, it is not knowing where you will end up, but you have questions that drive you in a certain direction, and you also have to collaborate with other disciplines. This is by now something that we don't have to talk about. We are doing it already. Jean-Marie, uh, what is the supramolecular chemistry all about? Oh, oh, interesting question. <laughs> First of all, I would like to begin by singing the praise of the ERC. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm the only person here who is retired, technically. But I have no intention to retire. <laughs> and the ERC, in fact, has given me the possibility to continue by an advanced grant when I was already retired. And the rest of my career, I accumulated enough money to be able to continue even more. <laughs> Now, the other thing is that I'm a chemist. I'm happy to be a chemist. If you had no chemistry, you would not be sitting here with all the clothes on. You would not be, have many clothes on your body. That's chemistry. So, I think we will have to think a bit more about uh, the role of chemistry in our society. Other sciences too, but I know that chemists have a bad reputation, which is very undeserved, very much so. Now, about uh, how we came to what we, what we did, it was a sort of a complicated way, if you look back at it. After, when, when it's done, you, it looks logical, and there is some logic in it. I started by wanting to study philosophy. And... Uh, I'm still very interested, but uh, when you are a youngster, you know, philosophy is big problems. You say, oh, these problems I can think about. But then suddenly you realize, but you have no way to check. How do you check that what you think is correct? That led me to look at something which would be, where is this coming from, the thinking? The thinking is coming from the brain, from the nervous system. And so in the beginning of the 60s, mid, middle of the 60s, I thought, okay, maybe a chemist can do something about how we function. But these things are complicated. Big molecules, big systems, and especially in the 60s, that's both very difficult. So as a chemist, I was very practical. I said, look, is there a phenomenon in the nervous system which is, well, it can be studied by a chemist, a poor chemist. And there is one, when I do this, the signal is transmitted by what is called the action potential, where along the nerves there is a signal transmitted, and that it depends on the changes across the nerve membranes of two entities, very simple ones, sodium ions, that's in kitchen salt, and potassium ions, which you have in our body also. And that then led me to what? To say, okay, are there entities which a chemist can make which are able to distinguish between a little ball, sodium, and a little larger one, potassium. And that we started to construct molecules which are able to do that. And this led then to the concept of molecular recognition, how do molecules recognize others 
What do they do in order to recognize it? What's the basis of molecular recognition? And just to convince you that that's very important, in your body, you have killer cells running around all the time as you're sitting here. And the killer cells are supposed to recognize the cells which have been transformed, cancer cells. If they make a mistake, you have a big problem. Either they destroy a healthy cell, no good, or they do not recognize a transformed, a cancer cell, no good. So the basic process of biology is how do molecules recognize each other. Without that, we don't exist. Molecular recognition is the basis of life. Seeing that, that's a big question. I have no solution to that, but you start progressively. And as a chemist, you can design systems. You say, OK, in order to study this, let's fabricate an object which we think should do this kind of job. And then, progressively, you can develop that. So I may say that this then led to the idea that since this depends on how molecules fit together, how they recognize each other, there is this famous uh, image which I usually bring in general public lectures, which is obvious, which was already mentioned and brought to chemistry by a very famous German chemist, Emil Fischer, when in 1894, 1894, he said that molecules have to fit together like a lock and a key. And if you remember that, you have learned something. Molecules fit together like lock and key. And that makes their specific interactions. And this then developed into the fact that if they fit together, they have to feel each other. They cannot do it without feeling. So there must be forces which lead to that. And that led to the step from molecular chemistry you are all made of molecules, but you are not single molecules, they are all populations. A molecular sociology, so to say, where they go together, they do something with one another, they hate each other, they like each other, they repel, they attract, and this is the basis of what we call supramolecular chemistry, because it is beyond molecular chemistry. Okay. Now we are going further, but okay. I stop here. Okay, thank you. No, I, I think it is important to give you a flavor of what uh, our eminent panel here is actually doing. But of course, there is something very basic behind also. You need a lab, you need people to work with, you need a continuity for your work, and this is where funding agencies step in. And I would like you just to very briefly say something about the importance of what, in your view, this kind of you know, basic um, working environment that you need, what is it that makes it productive? What is it that you really need? I mean, you have had distinguished careers. The Collège de France provides you with labs, etc. Um, you are working in a country that has not the same kind of infrastructures sometimes, and yet, you know, people are productive. So, so what is it, and where's the role of, where does the role of funding come in, and especially the kind of funding of the ERC type? The session here is organized by the ESC and the Kavli Foundation. The Kavli Foundation recognizes the results that have been obtained by the kind of work that the ESC and other uh, agencies that fund this kind of research um, are able to provide you with. Just who wants to say something? Ben or yes, so Emmanuel? <laughs> but please be short. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think ERC has been really key in providing a frame of funding that uh, involves most likely less bureaucracy than other types of, of funding, uh, of European funding. And that uh, this type of funding has been really key to promote, uh, the, to, to promote young scientists to really continue a career in science by providing sustainable funds to young scientists who want really to be independent and start their own line of, of, of research, and also to more senior scientists to be able to have a, a funding that is sufficient enough to ask, at the point, uh, blue sky research uh, questions and curiosity-driven uh, questions. So this has been really 
a very, very important tool uh, to add more, let's say, uh, yeah, more advantages uh, with regard to other, when compar comparing to other types of, of funding for labs focusing on, on, on basic science. Um, let, now, let, what, let, we, what you need to really yeah. have a, a lab, I would say, it's for sure, uh, you need time to do science, and that's why it's important that labs are, are funded with a type of funding that does not require a lot of management. Mm -hmm. Scientists tend to, to complain about the fact that they spend their time, um, how do you say, uh, um, um, revising and reviewing the work of others rather than doing their own work, and you need people. You need young people, and this is important to provide the young people also a funding that allows them to have the time to answer the biological, biological questions which they want to answer. And this is why uh, funding tools like ERC is extremely important. Let me jump to uh, the yeah. other side of the... No, of, very of our very quick, I think the ERC is, of course, extremely important. I got one, I'm happy about it. But the most important is starting grants for the young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's by far the most important. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had in Europe, and this is also why we started this institute we have set up in, in Strasbourg about uh, now 17 mm. years ago. Uh, young people in Europe, and it was not like that in the US, didn't have independence, independent thinking from professors and all that. And so I think the ERC starting grant was extremely important and is continuing to be very important because it makes possible, it enables young people to be independent, but responsible. You cannot have independence without responsibility. They are accountable. This is not so easy because it's some young people sort of said, okay, it's very nice to be in a big thing where you are covered by many... Uh, let's say, many ways in which you can continue working. But the ERC grant makes young people independent and then they have to be responsible for what they do and it has changed completely yeah. what happens in Europe. I, I remember when uh, the Scientific Council met for the first and second time, way, way back in 2007, and we were 22 members of the Scientific Council. We decided almost immediately we want two-thirds of the overall funding to go to young people. Precisely for these reasons, we realized, since many of our students also go to the US, I have spoken to many Europeans working in the US, would you be willing to come back under which conditions, or why would you not want to come back? And the answer is always the same. We get scientific independence earlier in the US than in, in Europe. So this is something that the ERC you know, has realized from the beginning. But, but what... Do, do you think that please. the ERC mm. might improve of that? Because mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, and uh, discussing with young people, I have the impression that they... Globally, they have the feeling that they are less fun than before doing science. So, and I think that's largely due to uh, the funding. And uh, in that respect, could that be possible, let's say, to uh, extend a little bit this funding? And especially, but maybe that's too detailed. No, but the, the way it's organized, okay? Um, uh, you start with, uh, let's say, you have a, an initial funding during uh, the starting round for seven years after the thesis. And after five years, and after, you jump in senior grants. So this, this is a big issue, I think. Yeah. They need also to <laughs> see what is the perspective. But let's go back to the, to the funding of, of ERC without getting into detailed management I, questions. I, <laughs> yeah. I just want to make <clears throat> a remark here. When I started as a young researcher at the university, my independent career, I didn't get anything, zero. So talking about the level of funding. Yes, it is competitive, but the ESC, and exactly as Professor Lane said, it is so crucial that we fund the young people, you know, the young talents in our institutes and universities to build up their independent research groups, etc. Also the Marie Curie Fellowships. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think ESC 
and we can, you can argue about it, but in my opinion, it's one of the best things that ever happened in Europe. It sets the standards of excellence, yeah, it puts the bar high, and it's recognized by our industries where they find excellent science and technology and innovation. It also is a signature for our students to come to the best institutes where they get the best frontier training. And we recruit students from all over the world thanks to these European programs, Marie Curie, etc. And that will bring our science forward. Let's never forget that. How we, how we confront our young talents with the frontiers of science. Not to train them for today, not to train them for tomorrow, but to be the leaders in science and innovation and in our society 10, 20 years from now. That's our duty. Thank you. Virginius, you come from a country that in many ways uh, does not ha enjoy the kind of advantages that other countries do. Tell us a little bit how you see this from your perspective. Mm, yeah, so in my country, but probably also in Europe, we always have these discussions actually should we fund the, the basic research and, and to what extent? And of course, it's a valid question, but I, I think that we should look at that a bit in a broader perspective because basic research is, is just part of ecosystem. And, and this ecosystem is comprised of basic research, <laughs> then applications and, and actually development of products. And actually, as with every ecosystem, the ecosystem is mm -hmm. healthy only when all parts are just kind of in equilibrium and working together. And, and sometimes in my country, there, there are attempts that actually, okay, we, we should start mainly product de development, but actually this is like putting the ecosystem on, on the head instead of, of their legs, because basic research is behind all innovations and product development. You know, I, I think we all face from time to time the impatience of politicians. And they want results now or even before yesterday. And it is very difficult to convey and communicate to politicians that you need a more long-term view. And that uh, you need this kind of basic science. And what very often is not seen, and, and Ben, you touched a crucial point, is also the young people and what we are teaching young people in terms of research skills, in terms of asking the right kind of questions that will help them wherever they go. They may go to industry, to public service, to universities, wherever. So this is part of it. But do you have any good ideas, you know, how can we communicate this better to, to politicians? We all face the problem. And then they say, yes, but, um, you know, we want results now and you cannot tell us when and what, etc. And we, we feel this impatience. Yeah, so I think the CRISPR story is, is a, a good message. It's a good because message. Because actually, yeah. as I already said, actually we started just in our research trying to understand very basic biological questions, but then actually it resulted in a really powerful tool that is actually very widely now used in, in very different fields. So, and, and, and very fast, as Emmanuel said, I mean, it's developed so, so quickly uh, as, as a tool. Do we know about, let's say, very important innovations that did not derive from basic science? I think that the story of science is just full of that. Right. And, and uh, historians of economics like Joel Mokia, yeah. uh, who have, you know, he studied the 18th, the 19th century, and he's very clear, you know, there was the kind of um, innovation and technology based on science that started in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So everything that happens in technology and innovation has a science base. And without that, we would be back, you know, before the 18th century and the 19th century. But still, you know, how do you communicate this to politicians? Yeah. The question that I ask myself is what is meant by innovation? Because actually the results are here. You have excellent science in Europe. Mm -hmm. Europe mm -hmm. is full of excellent scientists who are producing a lot, yeah. actually. <laughs> so it's just the fact. Uh, maybe it's not easy for the public or the lay audience to understand it, but it's, it's just a fact. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the technologies are going um, extremely fast. 
uh, Europe has a chance to also have access to those uh, technologies. And now the technologies go most likely faster than the science now because you can ask a lot of questions at the biology level, chemistry level, physical, <laughs> physics level mm -hmm. that you could not answer before. It goes extremely fast, even in medicine. I mean, uh, if you look at the technology, the equipment, it's <clears> extremely, extremely fast. The issue is more that uh, also an understanding that you need time to do science and all the programs in place are more promoting um, very, how do you say, fast framework, whereby a student in two, three years is supposed to have finished his, his thesis and it's very difficult yeah. for a student. That's why I think the young people are frustrated actually. Mm -hmm. They are frustrated because they start, they have a lot of curiosity, they are extremely excited, but then they say, my God, I have two, three years only. Mm -hmm. To, to answer a question where I know that I need more time. And it's also an intellectual work. Absolutely. It's a tedious work. Uh, it requires time. Mm. It re requires focus. It requires also uh, the, the possibility to fail. I have failed a lot during my career and happy to have failed because if I had not failed, I would not have succeeded. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what um, the, the framework of programs need to take into consideration. I think the politicians need also mm -hmm. to understand that we have excellent scientists and excellent mm -hmm. students, but what yeah. the students need is motivation to continue. Yeah. <laughs> Did you news? Exactly what Emmanuel is saying, that this is how ecosystem works, in fact, that initially science drives technology, but after some extent technology starts to drive science and actually gets into different fields. Yeah. That's right. No, there's this very close interlinkage. You know, it, um, in, in the 50s and 60s, people were speaking about the so-called linear model. You start with basic science, you move on to applied science, and then innovation was the market. And this is completely outdated by now because, as you rightly say, it's an ecosystem where uh, new research technologies feed back into basic science that produces new technologies. If I Christine, can, yes, you wanted if I can to come add in. Something, uh, with respect uh, in a, um, to the in a film, to the film in which uh, there are a lot of expectation medicine. Mm -hmm. um, taking the example of Alzheimer's disease, uh, a lo now. A lot of, let's say, um, potential therapeutic agents have been tested. And now the company uh, don't want anymore to invest because everybody realized that we don't know enough with respect to the first step of the disorders. So now they're asking to basic scientists, please, could you concentrate and really to try to uh, tell us what are the, the first step, what are the various, let's say, the critical point in the development in order we can really start thinking what could be uh, the relevant, uh, relevant uh, mm -hmm. um, therapeutic for the future. Mm -hmm. Jean-Marie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, a very simple thing, just to compare the two. John Kennedy, when he was president, said, we will cure cancer and we will go to the moon. Going to the moon was, to say, a solved problem. You had to do very carefully, high electronics had to be have perfect in your technology. Curing cancer, that was a research problem and it's still not solved. So, uh, going to the moon, we can. Curing cancer, we it's, need It's research. more difficult, yeah. But I hear you also say something which is very interesting that once industry discovers that they also have to deal with some very unresolved basic questions, mm -hmm. this might be something that politicians are willing to listen to. And uh, I think this is really the, the, the closing of the, of the circle when you ask, you know, how do you get to spark innovation? through basic science, because it's the mechanism, and then you do have still basic questions to answer. Ben. No, you, you are absolutely right. Thanks, thanks to the ESC programs, for instance, and all this basic funding of Europe, industry now recognizes where in Europe the excellent science is done, and where they should find their partners, where they should find strategic corporations, where the best students are, etc., where they were really at the frontiers. And there are, of course, tremendous discoveries 
all over the sciences, and it was mentioned by my uh, neighbor here, it goes at an enormous pace. But to translate that into applications, you know, that's a, a big challenge. And of course, there we team up, yeah, with, uh, with industries, yeah, but we also uh, connect to how, how to make startups and those things. But let me ask a question, you know, about the general public and the politicians. Who has no smartphone here? Uh, I see on the front row many people have a smartphone. They look at the smartphone now. Yes, thank you. Well, everybody has a smartphone. Good. Did you realize that the fundamental science, the physics and chemistry in the 40s and 50s of the past century, built the transistors and the display materials for your displays, the soft materials? The word smartphone did not exist. Nobody had an idea that we would have a smartphone today. The first computer was built, which filled half this room and could do less than your smartphone. It took 50 years by all the disciplines, together with industry, to build a smartphone. We have it now since 12 years, eh? And it completely changed our world. The whole way we communicate, including social problems, it changed our world. <clears throat> it started with blue sky, fundamental research, and nobody had any idea. So this is the main message that I would like to take everyone here in the audience with you. But we have one last round. Um, I would like to ask um, the, um, my panel members here, what is your wish? How can we improve, be it the funding, be it the basic science, be it the way how the ESC functions or how to give more money or whatever you want. What is, um, you know, what is needed to keep the momentum going? Because the ESC is a success story. I think it has put Europe on the map. We have colleagues from the US who envy Europeans for having an ESC uh, in, in terms of, of funding. But, you know, what is needed to keep the momentum going? Who wants to start? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> the issue was already discussed. I, I think that the most important thing is just to, to provide a proper funding for, for younger people. And ERC is playing really, doing really a great job in that because actually I, I think that we should trust in young people and, and, and give them money with some certain responsibility and do not be afraid that they fail. Usually what happens in science, you move from one failure to another until you find something useful. Thank you. Christine? I would say um, no risk, no gain. And um, generally speaking, I think that um, in the panels, uh, let's say what you receive as, as the answer when you are not accepted is, let's say, not enough preliminary data. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge tendency, and I think that we should fight against that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the ERC functions quite well, and um, there's no foolproof. Uh, you cannot uh, always mistakes made here and there. Some people who get it who shouldn't get it, and others who don't get it who should have gotten it. That's the same. Uh, but on the average, I think it's a quite uh, successful system and it has shown that it can operate and works well. Uh, the other thing is that now there is also freedom of thinking from, let's say, if somebody has realized something, one can give some years of letting things go, freedom. And this is now why in Europe uh, it was started. You mentioned the Institute yeah. of Advanced Study in Princeton. That num was number one. Now, a number of universities now have introduced these kind of institutions where you are free for some time. And of course, if you don't produce, then you go back into the rank. Mm -hmm. But as long as it works, and then it's good. And for instance, the Collège de France is such an institution where you, yeah, we, are, we are privileged and you can do, we are much more free for doing research. And this is what universities then also have done around the world in many, many regions of the world now, the institutes of advanced study. So I think the ERC is in this line of freedom, but I insist responsibility. Of course. Okay. You cannot just give money without being accountable. 
Emmanuel. Yes, uh, I will say uh, basic science is the foundation of innovation. But beyond this, there is also the understanding that types of funding like ERC does not only fund research. It allows as well to fund the training of scientists who will then go to industry. I mean, all scientists receive uh, training in basic sciences. This is just uh, a fact. So through funding of basic research, we also fund <laughs> the training of, of scientists who will then make uh, the difference in the industrial world. So this is important to mention. And then there is a quote that I like from the French microbiologist Louis Pasteur, a quote that is uh, maybe 150 years old and more. It's, mm. you don't have uh, a category of sciences which you will name applied sciences. Oh. Now applied sciences is more named translational sciences or translational research. Uh, you have sciences and the applications mm. as the fruit that comes from the tree. And so you have the tree that is really the basic science, so you need to provide seed for the tree to grow, you need to provide nutrients and sustainability of nutrients for the tree to grow so that the fruits can come up and the fruits are the applications. And I like very much uh, this quote because it's uh, exactly uh, the, pound, the, the, the point. You don't have uh, fruits without a tree, you don't have applications and innovation without uh, um, basic uh, science. And something I want to add, there is really a wish uh, from the young generation to continue to think, acquire knowledge, uh, develop ideas and be curious, and it's important to provide means for uh, those uh, young <laughs> uh, kids who are really interested in science to be able to do so and not be frustrating before they even started in principle. And I think, I think this is really where the focus should be uh, mainly. We uh, think about uh, the future horizons of Europe. How to build a sustainable society we all dream of. Let me emphasize creativity and imagination is the only really sustainable thing we have. We should challenge our young talents that will bring us forward at the frontiers of science and excellent science will bring excellent innovation. Let's be daring, let's challenge our industries as well, not in isolation, but cooperating with them. Think about new industries, but please, please, give us space to think, to ask the real questions. The real questions, what does it mean? The questions society asks us, the challenges. What does it mean if we translate that in scientific, technological, or humanitarian questions? Mm -hmm to really bring us forward, to push the frontiers and to get to solutions to the future. That's my dream. Wonderful. <laughs> so, if I, if I would just um, sum up, is a, is a big word, but I just want to remind us of what we have heard and learned from you and your experience. And I think one key message is indeed we need free spaces and we need to give time. Time both under the aspect of responsibility, accountability, and to take up the metaphor of the tree. You know, things need time to mature. Plants don't grow overnight and different plants need different times of maturation. And we have to give this time to mature to young people, that's our obligation but then there will be the fruits for a better Europe and a better society. So let's thank our panel members and we thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.